this is Rachel Leishman. And Lauren Milberger. And this is The Fordcast, a Harrison Ford podcast. Where we discuss all of his movies and other things for your pleasure. And or Lauren is an NPR host. <laughs> in her um, but this week, talking about the big one. We got to Star Wars. Episode 4. Episode 4. It's called Episode 4, Episode 4. <laughs> well, that's... You brought that up to me. Was what? This is our fourth episode. Oh, yeah. And we're, <laughs> you, for, you forgot what you told me. I've had a very stressful weekend. She has. We both have. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. So, it's episode four of the podcast. And then it's, it's episode, episode four, four of New Hope. New Hope of Star Wars, which I overdid the research. Yeah, you. I did none because I went to a musical last night, so I spent my time in a theater, and you did That's all of okay. the research. You bring your plethora of knowledge of <laughs> Star Wars and New Hope to this podcast, so <laughs> it's okay. Because I, instead of being a good co-host, I went and rushed a musical. You're such a good co-host. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, we're really super excited to talk about Star Wars. Uh, and I apparently am a little too excited. <laughs> yeah, um, there is at least like 15 pages of research yes, that Lauren I'm, handed me. Which we don't have to talk about all of it. It's just so that we have a lot of information. I got really bored at work. And I found a lot of really cool stuff about Harrison Ford. So, you know, I thought it was appropriate. <laughs> so, um, should we start with uh, your famous summary? Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. So this will be interesting because I didn't get to rewatch it because I started I started it with the knowledge that I probably wouldn't get to go and see because I tried to see American Psycho and I was like, oh, I'm not going to be able to get a ticket, so it'll be fine. <laughs> Got a ticket and was out till super late and so I didn't finish A New Hope. So this is like me remembering A New Hope from like a month ago. So like, here goes nothing. I don't think you're going to forget it. Maybe not. Okay. So and hopefully everyone watching, watching, has, listening has, has knows it has seen Star Wars. Um, okay, so in A New Hope, which is the first ever Star Wars, but Episode Four in the so far seven movie franchise, um, starts soon to be nine. Soon to be nine. Well, in like <laughs> five years. Um, so it starts with um, the. The Rebels. Okay, maybe we shouldn't do this. <laughs> no, we're going to do it. It starts with... Because I think I've everybody knows. Part. I think everyone knows. No, but I want to do okay. it. I'm, I'm committed now. Okay. All right, so it starts with um, Leia on her ship, and she's giving uh, R2-D2 information. But you don't know who either of those people are if you've just now seen Star Wars for the first time. But Cinnamon Bun, Princess Leia, is giving information to R2-D2... And um, she is hiding in the back room with a blaster because she's trying to keep from Darth Vader and his um, stormtroopers who have invaded the ship. And then an escape pod goes off and they say, oh, well, there's no life on it. It's fine. Not knowing that R2-D2 and C-3PO, who are droids, got on it and are taking the pod to Tatooine. And so Leia gets captured and Darth Vader like, threatens her that she needs to, like, tell him the inform- all this information and everything. And so she won't because Leia's strong as all fuck. And so um, he's planning on torturing her and all this great stuff. And so then it shows the droids on Tatooine getting bought by... <laughs> Luke and his uncle this Owen. so fascinating. I want to see this movie. It's great. So then Luke and his uncle Owen end up buying C-3PO and R2-D2, even though they weren't going to buy R2-D2 first. They are going to buy this little red one that blew up, and so R2-D2 was like, Wah! and then went with them. And so then R2-D2 keeps being like, I have a mission, I have to find Obi-Wan Kenobi. And then he runs away and gets captured by some Sam people. And so then C-3PO and Luke are like, oh no, he's captured by the Sand People. And then Obi-Wan saves all of them from the Sand People. And so then Obi-Wan Kenobi is talking about how he fought alongside his father, but then his father died. Luke's but the hand, father. Yeah, Luke's father died in the hands of Darth Vader. Ha! And so then Obi-Wan Kenobi um, gets the message from R2-D2 that's Leia, and she's saying, Obi-Wan Kenobi, or help me Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. So then they know that they have to save the princess. So they go and they try and find a pilot. 
and they find Han Solo and Chewbacca in a cantina, and Chewbacca, not Chewbacca, I don't know what I'm saying, Han Solo is sitting at a table with Greedo, who's this green dude, and... That happens after. No, but I'm, yeah, oh, okay. but I'm explaining, no, that ha- he, oh yeah, you're right, sorry. <laughs> he agrees to help them, they leave to go get ready, Han Solo is sitting at the table with Greedo, it's not important, they end up on a ship all together, there you but go. That's good. Greedo... Jump ahead. Han Solo and Greedo get in a battle, and the biggest argument is who shot first, which we're going to talk about later. I'm doing a summary, so this, that doesn't matter right yeah, now. Yeah, doesn't matter. But who shot first, Greedo or Han Solo, doesn't matter. We'll talk about it later, we'll discuss what we think. But then, so they get on the Falcon, because it's the fastest ship in the galaxy. It finished the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs, and it's really exciting, but the ship is a piece of crap, and that's where Luke says, what a piece of junk, and that's... In every Star Wars movie, they make fun of the Falcon. Fuck them. Falcon's awesome. It is. So then, Chewie and Han, they all fight. They get on the ship, whatever. They get on to the Death Star. Right? Yeah, it's the Death Star. They get onto the Death Star. Well, they're stuck in a tractor beam, so they're forced onto yeah, the Death Star. Yeah, they're forced on the Death Star. But then, yeah. fast forward to them. They get Stormtrooper suits. They get into this room. There's a great improvised bit where Harrison Ford is talking to the other Stormtroopers, and he's just like... Yeah, we're fine. How are you? And then there's a bunch of guns, and they know they have to find Leia. Oh, I forgot. They blew up Alderaan. Yes, that's they, important. <laughs> before they get in the tractor beam, it shows Leia with Darth Vader. He's trying to get a hold of her. He runs into her at one point. It's really funny. If you watch, if you watch closely, she's talking to the general guy, and Darth Vader, could, the guy who played Darth Vader, the Scottish guy, couldn't see where Carrie Fisher was. No. And she so just walked in and bumps into the I back of Leia. It literally just walked, like, Darth Vader just runs into her. And that's the same thing, like, with the stormtrooper who hits his head off the wall and they just left it in. It's oh, like, yeah, why? Yeah. But they, anyway, so then he's like, you're not going to tell us. And he's like, he threatens her, that they're, he threatens that they'll blow up Alderaan if she doesn't tell them. And she says. Where the rebel base is. Yeah, and she doesn't. And then they blow it up anyway. Yeah. And these are villains. So then they take her back to this room, which I don't understand why she's laying on that bed, like she's like ready for someone to come and have sex with her when they find when Luke finally finds. She's Leia. lounging. Whatever. She's but, gonna die soon. She's taking her time. Yeah, but Luke. Okay, so Luke and Han get the suits. They're all trying to figure it out. Chewie's scared. C three PO and R two D two are just like in a room helping them. It, it, whatever. They're all trying to get Leia out. So then they get Leia and. They're, like, trying to run away, but all the stormtroopers come to get them. So then they're, like, trying to shoot them, but they're, like, they're coming from both directions. And then Leia becomes a badass with her yes. gun, and she go, she shoots the um, trash the wall. chute. She shoots the wall so they can fall into a trash chute. And she's, like, get in! And they do, and then it's a trash compactor. And so the trash compactor starts moving close together, and everyone's, like, no! Nah, we're gonna die! And so then Han is just groping Leia the entire time. Like, trying to help her up. Which that is unfortunate. He's just, like, groping her. And then R2-D2 thinks they're all dead. Or C-3PO thinks they're dead, but R2-D2 finally stopped the trash compactor. And so then they escape. Um, and then they escape the Death Star. But Luke blows it up. And now I've, like, completely forgot what happens at the end. And then all I remember is the metal ceremony. Okay, well, Obi-Wan Kenobi sacrifices That's himself. right! Oh, I forgot about the battle! Okay, so then Obi-Wan Kenobi... And Darth Vader is sac- like getting a fight, and Obi Wan Kenobi kind of like, which it's if you a, watch the prequels, you a understand. Rematch. It's a rematch. Yeah, it's like a rematch. Master and, and Padawan. And he's just kind of like, you know what? Okay. And he like succumbs to Darth Vader and dies, and Obi Wan vanishes, and you yeah, see his weird. coat fall. That's weird. And you're like, what? And Luke's upset, and then they get on the Falcon. Yes. Okay. And then they oh, leave. Oh, and they leave. And then uh, Leia's pretty sure that they're being tracked. Han thinks he's fabulous because they got loose from, you know, they, they yeah. escaped. But they are being tracked. They she's are right. being tracked because she's smart. She, they are. So they... I know Luke th- does it in the X-Wing. He blows up the Death yes, Star. Yes, a... But I don't... I cannot remember how they get from the Falcon to the Death Star. So they, they go to... They go to the Rebel base... And oh, they go to Yavin. Oh, Yavin four, and then uh, Han Solo's like, "I'm getting out of here with my money because but he all doesn't. I care about is money." But then at the last minute, while they're on the the planes going towards the Death Star to do this plan thing that they have to kill it, because there's always a way to blow up the Death Star or anything like the Death Star. It's very easy to do, apparently. They blow it up, 
They get awards at the end. They, they have a gay wedding at the end of the movie. Um, yeah, so they're like, I'm, I gotta I'm trying, finish I'm my rundown. Trying, trying so yeah, version. they yeah. do like, Yavin, blow it up. It was a game I played once. It was really cool. You have to get the X-Wing through the Death Star and blow it up, and everyone blows it up. And they're like, yay, woo, we did it. Some people die. Sorry. Nah, and so then, then Han and Luke walk up to Leia, who has medals, and it looks like a wedding ceremony. And they're wearing the, and they're the, wearing the same pants. Yeah. And so Luke's then, wearing Han's clothes. That's yeah, weird. It's weird. And then they get medals, and Leia keeps flirting with Han at, without words. It's weird. Well, he winks at her. Yeah, he winks at her, and she's like, "Swear, it. and it's stupid." But and then, it's and then it goes, and it starts the music, and it's <laughs> that's Star Wars. That's Star Wars. Yay! I did it. <laughs> you did it. So, okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about where Harrison was in his career at the time because I think it's really interesting and how there's a lot of sort of famous stories about how he got the role of Han Solo and I read them all and sort of figured out my own version and put it together. Um, what's interesting is that um, Harrison had not really acted since 1974. He really felt that carpentry was his job. He had a second baby. Uh, and then um, he was actually uh, hired by Fred Roos who is, or, well, here's an idea. So Fred Roos is someone that Harrison would consider his sort of mentor at the time. He was really pushing him for jobs. A lot of people just really weren't very interested in him. Um, something I really love that he says about Harrison is, uh, this is a quote, he was not a leading man in a way they thought of leading men in that time, which is crazy. Um, the strongest quality I saw was his great sense of masculinity. He had extreme confidence and, uh, <laughs> With, oh, sorry. Um, and a kind of dangerous intensity that all kind combined together with his droll sense of humor. Uh, he was not conventionally good looking, which is ah! crazy. Uh, he was also tight lipped, standoffish, and most important, uh, or no, oh, I'm sorry, and most people thought he had an attitude. He was incredibly cranky. But I thought he was going to be a star when we got along famously. So he kept pushing him up for all these jobs. He helped him get um, the job in American Graffiti. Uh, but he, people really weren't as excited about Harrison Ford as he was. Uh, he really wanted Harrison Ford. He was the, uh, not necessarily the casting director, but he was the um, sort of casting like consultant. Really wanted um, Harrison to come in for Han Solo. But George Lucas was refusing to work with anyone he had worked with before, because he apparently didn't want to have like a repertory of players. So they were having auditions, and um, now people tell the story, I've heard it different ways, you've probably heard it too, that apparently Francis Ford Coppola hired him to do it, but I think the confusion is, is that Francis Ford Coppola and George Lucas are really good friends. In fact, here's something that's interesting. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola is apparently the inspiration for Han Solo. I know, uh, that kind of blew my mind. Because, uh, and it's sort of interesting because if you think of like George Lucas as Luke, there's sort of like, you know, Hey, I'm gonna save the day, and I'm really shy, and but I'm I'm a good guy. And then uh, if like Francis Ford Coppola, who was known apparently as being very like brash and good at self promotion and sort of overbearing and a bit of a sort of a swashbuckling kind of a guy, uh, and they were really good friends. So you have like they were huh. Han and Luke, which I think was really cool. So he hired him to um, put this very elaborate door in the studio where they were all working. In fact, Fred Roos uh, also did Apocalypse Now as producer, because he's also producing. So they were all sort of together. Brian De Palma shared an office with <laughs> Lucas, and he actually wrote The Crawl for Star Wars, which is Oh, the I opening crawl. Yeah. I, I, mm. yeah. So they were doing, so, so he's casting Carrie, and he's casting uh, Star Wars. So a lot of people that were supposed to be in Star Wars end up being in Carrie, because he took them first, because Lucas was like really shy and like couldn't really talk in auditions. So they kind of like did it together. Interesting. So Amy Irving could have actually been... Which is Leia if she wasn't in Car Carrie? It's like really, it's like very weird. So he hires him to do this really sort of you know elaborate door. In fact, I read something that said that he was really embarrassed when all of his friends or people he knew were coming in to audition for Han Solo, so that they had him like do it at night. Which I don't really get then how he was there during the day, but he definitely didn't read people for Han Solo. So when you have a reader at an audition. Mm -hmm. They hire someone, usually an actor, to read the other lines with the people who are auditioning. Now, a thing that a lot of cast directors will do is if they like an actor and they really want them to be, you know, seen for the role, but they know that the producer or the director doesn't want to see them, is they will bring them in as a reader. 
I bet you that Fred knew if he did that, it would be really obvious. So what it sounds like what ended up happening was, is yes, he was hired to build a door in the studio that was run by Francis Ford Coppola and George Lucas, but really it was Fred who was like, hired him and didn't really tell Harrison what was happening. And then it was like, oh, we need a reader for all the Luke and Leia's. Oh, you know what? Harrison's in the hall. Why don't we have him come out? I mean, maybe not exactly like that, but that's what it seems like happened. And so he spent several days reading Han Solo against everybody. So he didn't just audition once. He auditioned for two days. And, and now he is dead. Yes, it, it actually took everything out of him. Um, and then even after he got cast, Lucas still was like really unsure because he hated working. He didn't want to work with the same people that it almost went to Christopher Walken. Oh, I would have killed myself. I know, right? Christopher Walken. Um, and on a Reddit recently, Harrison said that he was quite surprised when he was offered the role at the end of the day. His principal job was carpentry. So he pretty much just sort of, you know, I don't know, let's say given up, but like it's sort of a nice, I think, really cool story because, you know, sometimes there are lulls in your life and, you know, don't give up on your dreams. Never give up. Yes. <clears throat> uh, um, and so we wanted to talk about when the first time we remember seeing it was. I think that's a great idea. Um, I, the first time, I remember seeing it with my, both my brothers and they remastered them. It was not the first time I'd ever seen so it. that's what, 2004 when they remastered no, them? No. That was like 98, 99. Oh, okay. Oh, that's when the DVD came out. Okay. Because yeah. I would like to talk about sort of the changes they made, which are weird because I don't think yeah. I've seen it since they made all those changes. It was terrible. But yeah, now, um, pretty bad. I, um, saw the, I saw them with my brother and that's not the first time I remember seeing it. It's, I remember seeing it when I was younger with my other brother, but that was like the first big time because I saw it in theaters. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. When they re-released it. Yes. And then, uh, yeah. Because uh, I went and saw all of them. Oh, like like it's a marathon? Yeah. And that's the first time you ever saw them? No. Oh. I had seen them prior to that, but that's the first one I remember. Oh, you like, remember? That's the first time I remember. I've seen them prior to that, but that was like the first time I remember watching I can't remember. I literally can't remember. I know that I saw Empire and Jedi first, which we talked about mm -hmm. on the first podcast. And and for a while I thought, oh, I must have just seen Empire and then I saw New Hope. But no, because I, when I saw New Hope, I knew they were related. And uh -huh. it was weird. I didn't understand. I was too young and I was confused. <laughs> Why is she kissing him on the cheek? Why is Luke, like, really kind of into her? That's his sister. I was I was confused. So I don't remember my a time in my life when Star Wars was not in it. Literally can't um, remember. I just remember that was like the first time I remember seeing it. So what are your favorite parts? Of A New Hope? Yeah. Um, the Cantina scene. Because I just like Obi-Wan Kenobi's response when Han says that it's the fastest ship and it did the Castle Run in 12 parsecs. And Obi-Wan Kenobi looks like he's like, okay, cool, great. Yeah, I've seen, like, I've seen a lot. Like he's so annoyed by like, he's like, wow, and I love that. And then I also just love the scene where they're in the Death Star and Chewbacca is, he's, he keeps going, come over here! And Chewbacca just shakes his head at him. Yeah, something that really sort of surprised me a lot in this particular one, because I hadn't seen it in a really long time, and I realized watching it that I watched Empire and Jedi so many times, but I didn't watch this one a lot, is he really is kind of like an animal as opposed to I feel like he became more like I want to say a human but like there's this scene where, where Han like kind of like scratches his head like a dog and then he's like scared and I was like Chewbacca really? I didn't know if he'd really be scared. I feel like that his character kind of evolved and was very different here. Um kind of. I mean like he's very different in The Force Awakens but I think that's just because Chewbacca well, when, yes, it, when he is yeah, Wookiees li older. live to be like 100 years old, but that's like 50 years with Han. So it's more like they have like a bicker. I mean, they always had a bickering relationship, but it's even more so like that. Yeah. No, um, I watched a, a special from 1977, and Harrison said that at that time Chewbacca was 200 years old. I don't know if that ever came Chewie. out. Yeah, he's 200. So he's like 300 now, almost. I get almost, yeah, not completely, but yeah, so that was interesting. It was actually a really cool special. There was a lot of uh, 
really interesting stuff like Mark uh, Hamill saying she's really a chump if she goes for Han Solo. Oh, I remember that because, but like you said, Emin, was that there was information that they were supposed to like very outrightly be brother and sister in the first one. It's funny because I, I don't, the original, original idea, yes, it was about Luke, Leia, their brother Biggs, which is a reference that, that Luke makes to someone who was working on the farm, I noticed. I was like, hey, and Luke Skywalker is like this general character, or general Skywalker, and he helps them, kind of like Obi-Wan, to save their father, Kane. And Kane and Skywalker are the only humanoids. Han Solo is a small part as like a green alien. But this was the first time I found info that was like, yeah, Luke and Leia were sisters. But eventually when this movie came out, they were sisters, brother and sister. They were not supposed to be. But it's interesting that like the first kernel of an idea. So when he says, oh, we always knew, he's really not lying, actually. But by the time that he wrote this particular script, because also his script was so long, he had so many ideas, they said that it could have been nine movies. And they, they actually plotted out nine movies eventually. Which is interesting now that there will be nine movies. There'll probably be more. It's Disney. I kind of hope not. I kind of need some closure. Disney will keep it going. Uh, so pretty much as I will die without knowing what will happen to this family. The world anymore. Yeah, people will die if they don't know what happens to the Skywalkers. I don't mean I'm going to die. I just mean that eventually they're going to be making so many movies that <laughs> I will die and they still won't be done with the damn story. I mean, I just need some closure. Please. I need it to end, so then I'll be happy. <laughs> oh, um, God. But um, in that special, too, George Lucas said that uh, it's anyone's guess who will end up with, with uh, Princess Leia. But he did think that Luke was more devoted to her than Han Solo. Ha! I say ha to that. Uh, do you want to talk about what uh, Carrie and Mark's first impressions of, of Harrison were? Yeah. Um, okay, so what was great about this movie was that Mark had a crush on Carrie Fisher, but Carrie Fisher had a crush on Harrison Ford. And so, poor little Mark. Poor, poor little Mark. Well, poor little Mark. I mean, he met his wife very shortly after that. Yeah, he was Poor fine. little Mark more about the car accident he was in. Oh. Um, but Carrie, um, and she said this recently too, was the first time she saw him. She just kind of thought that he was a movie star. Like he went from, she said, she remembered seeing him in the readings and he didn't look like one. And then the minute she saw him on set, he looked like a movie star. Oh, like in the outfit and everything? Yeah, like he went from, she was like, I remember sitting in the readings where, yeah, I was, she goes, I was so nervous that I didn't even think about it. She goes, then the minute I saw him on set, he looked like a movie star. But then Mark was scared to death and fascinated of him. So there's two very different things. Yeah. There's a lot of that, actually, because like, I also found information where George Lucas said that he felt that this was the movie that sort of mellowed him as an actor, Harrison, that you know, showed him with people like Alec Guinness you know, how to be a real professional and act professionally on set, um, to take it to do his homework, all this stuff that he wasn't necessarily a serious guy. Uh, there have been some pranks, I think, on the set of American Graffiti, but Harrison, I think, also said that he was influenced by a lot of those other people that were there and the character he was playing. Because Mark also said that he was so impressed because he saw him writing in the margins and like really note note taking on his character, uh, always giving like a different line reading that was like unique and different. So from Mark Hamill's point of view, it sounds like he already was a very dedicated actor. Mm -hmm. George didn't really seem to think so. Because George Lucas didn't want him to play Han. He didn't. That's true. Um, what's also, I think, really funny is that um, I found this quote from sort of like early on that um, Harrison wasn't really sure like how Star Wars would sort of land with people, and he thought that either it would be like really wide audience, get a lot of recognition, or it'd be so silly that his kids would be embarrassed for him to leave the house. Oh, I know. But then what I think is cool too is that there was this great article in GQ recently where they asked him if, if he thought it was going to be a success. Actually, I feel like you'd want to read that one. Um, yeah, um, he said, <laughs> fuck no. Um, it was a bizarre film, very bizarre. Listen, I was never a science fiction fan, but what I felt about Star Wars was that it was sort of a morality tale, a fairy tale that often touches people's hearts. And that's where I thought if people did go for it, that, that is where people would be captured. This is what would hold their interest. I think the success of these films also comes from being attached 
to the recognition of human archetypes and emotional relationships, I'll bet, in a galaxy far, far away and at a time beyond our comprehension. Yeah. Which was very, is very interesting because I saw something today on the internet where someone said, for somebody who is very, very outright said he's not nostalgic yeah. and that he could care less about Star Wars, he, like, pinpointed what Star Wars meant to people in the bonus features for The Force yes, Awakens. Yes, he did, yeah. Because he talks about how it's a generational thing and you pass it down in families and it's like this thing that people show, like, the people that they care about. And so he kind of, like, really, for for how much he doesn't like it, is the one who pinpointed... I do think it's changed, though. I think his thought about it has changed. I bet getting to know J.J., who was a fan and who may have told him stories like that or other people... I mean, mm-hmm. I heard Carrie Fisher say this, too, that... Over time, she started to realize that it was a thing that was passed down to generations mm-hmm. and that that was something really great. So that, that's why I wanted to sort of read both these sort of quotes because I feel like it's sort of kind of an evolution as well is that he had such a really good experience on The Force Awakens. Um, it took away kind of the bad maybe experience he had on Jedi. That was sort of his last, sort of the last taste, taste of in his it, mouth. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, I don't know. I, I, well, was I think he likes it, and then I also think well, he would I, like it if no one brought Star Wars up to him ever again. Well, there's a difference, though. I mean, I, I was listening to a Nerdist interview where literally he's like, can I bring up Star Wars? And he's like, you can try. Like, he was really nasty about it. And so I... I'm oh, not nasty, but just like, like, no, I don't want to talk about it. And I kind of... I can understand. Like, if that's all people ask you about, like, for over 30 years you and you you might and you feel like you've done like better work but I think that that's all changed I think that I mean that was something too I mean if we're going to talk about Force Awakens that like surprised me was watching it a little bit like up close on my computer as opposed to such a big screen I really appreciated his performance more and just how there was more meat in it for him and I, I just think that now he has a different a different approach to it a different idea it seems it seems to me I do like um you pointed out the parallels. I like the pair on our little thing. Should we I, talk? Yeah, well, we're, we're there. Yeah, there, that was what I did, actually. I, since the, since the DVD download, so to speak, you know, came out, uh, I was able to watch Star Wars, then watch The Force Awakens, and then this morning, watch Star Wars. So to see them together was really, really interesting. <laughs> I like um, how you kind of, like, mapped out the difference... I did. Because a couple of them... For Han's character. Yeah, a couple of them have been, like, on the internet, which is the, um, he doesn't believe in the Force. Yeah. New Hope in comparison. There's a whole scene where he Oh, says, I forgot about that in my rundown. Yeah. There's a whole scene where he, where he, talks he calls about, it hokey. Yeah, but what's interesting is he says, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase here, I don't believe that some mystical thing controls my destiny Uh which is interesting is that he talks about how he doesn't he's seen a lot of things he doesn't believe in it but then he ends it with my destiny because in the end it does in the end it is death (laughs) spoiler alert um if you haven't seen all the star Wars movies i would maybe not listen to the rest of this podcast (laughs) in case we let something slip like that yes but we just kind of alluded to it um leia says i wonder if he cares about anything or anyone here i'm gonna say it I mean, he dies for, for the love of his family and and for Leia. Um, in fact, he even says, I take orders from one person, me. And then, and then he's at the end, he pretty much, orders. you know, I mean, I don't want to say that he didn't go after his son because he loved him, because I think he did. But he did it because, because he loved Leia and he loved his family and she asked him to. Agreed. I'm going to cry. I mean, this is like the other night where I went to the George Lucas talk show and all they did... Oh, tell them about what that is. Um, okay, so the George Lucas talk show is this show that's done at UCB where Connor Ratliff pretends to be George Lucas with his co-host, um, Jar Jar Binks. And, um, it's, yeah, uh, Sean Distin plays Jar Jar Binks. And it's very funny because Connor Ratliff is very much impersonating George Lucas and then Sean Distin is just Sean Distin with a pair of bunny ears on <laughs> saying he's Jar Jar Binks. It's great. Um, well, this week, Connor Ratliff couldn't be there. So, J.J. Abrams, a.k.a. Colin Jost, or not Colin Jost, Casey Jost is brother. Oh, Sorry, um, Casey. Casey Jost um, was J.J. Abrams, and Brandon Scott Jones was there, and a man whose name was George Lucas, just like his real name was George Lucas, but okay. it was spelled like Jorge. Um, and his name is George Lucas, 
came and they all were just like answering questions. And I was very, I was very much going to ask J.J. Abrams if Harrison Ford came back for episode eight, was he going to be his character from regarding Henry <laughs> and have to relearn cognitive skills? That's great. And um, I talked to Casey after because I know Casey and Casey was like, I have no, I've never seen regarding Henry, but that would have been so funny if I did. Yeah, I wish you had done that. And that he was, really well, I, had, I didn't get chosen, but he was like, I would have, I would have laughed. But, um, it's, uh, what happened was we ended up watching The Force Awakens with J.J. Abrams' director commentary the uh, entire time, which was Casey Jost commenting on it, and Brandon Scott Jones, who had seen Star Wars, like, once, but couldn't remember any of them. And then watch The Force Awakens the night before. And so he thought the guy in the very beginning who gives Poe the... Uh, Lore? The what? Lore, Lore Santa? Yeah. Tekka? He thought that was Obi-Wan Kenobi. Oh, no. And we were all like, no. The no. whole audience went, no. And then <laughs> he's like asking a question and I screamed no. And he goes, oh my god, I'm so sorry. Who did I upset? And I was like, no, you didn't upset any... Like, I screamed because <laughs> I saw so Han. Wrong. No, I saw oh. Han dying. Like, I saw the scene. Uh, so then what they decided to do was, for, like, four times through, they just no, showed the Han Solo no. death scene over and over and over again. And someone, like, my friend Daniel, who was, like, a row behind me, just reached up and put his hand on my shoulder and was like, I'm so sorry. Because I was just like, this is my worst nightmare. It's just Han Solo dying over and over and over oh, again. That's pretty funny. It's sad, but it's, it's, oh, it's, it's pretty I'm funny. I'm so upset. So upset. Yeah, so we're gonna we're actually also gonna talk more about the, that DVD and review it next time since we have so much to kind of talk about. Yes. Um, is there any other parallels with New Hope that you would like to discuss before we move on? Um, I mean, not really the parallels, but I do like. I just I keep looking at the information you have on the Falcon and Chewie mainly because I just love Chewie. Yeah, no, that's why I thought you would want to. Well, it's talk very about interesting that. to me that it says that Harrison was afraid that children would be scared of Chewbacca, because I thought that was really interesting. Chewbacca that. is every little kid's favorite. Like I, when I went to Disney and like all little kids saw Chewie, they were so excited it was Chewie. Well, what I love about what he said was that that was why he felt that he should have a very sort of loving relationship with he, with the two of them, and that he worked on that so that he felt the kids wouldn't be scared of it. And I think that's really sort of interesting. I don't know if that helped or not, but, like, it's, from an actor's point of view, that's sort of an interesting thing to work on. Yeah. I mean, it's very smart, but at the yeah. same time, I was like, I would have never... Because what I think what I think it established is that you feel that these two are buddies and that they've been traveling for a while. Yeah. They have, they have a, a history and a relationship. Why is everything based off of George's dog? Yeah, so George's, George Lucas's dog's name is Indiana. Which is why Indiana Jones is named Indiana. Yeah, and so he based... Chewbacca off his dog. Everything's based off his dog. Apparently. And then what's also sort of piggybacking on that a little bit is George Lucas didn't think that the movie would be a success, so Steven Spielberg was like, come on, we'll go to Hawaii and we'll go on vacation. And that's where they came up with the idea for Indiana Jones. I also really did like, um, well, I just, I love the fact that they were running around promoting the movie and everything, mm -hmm. that none of them knew how big the movie got. That's true, yeah. They, they had no idea. Like, Mark no Hamill internet. got off a plane and turned to Harrison Ford and Carrie Fisher and said, who are these people here for? And they were there for them. No one had any clue. I mean, Lucas even screened it for his friends, uh, minus the score, which I think is really important, minus most of the special effects, so it was like <laughs> stock footage. And they were like, oh, George, we're so sorry for you. This is going to be bad. <laughs> and then it's the biggest movie. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Of all time. I mean, it changed not only the way that, you know, films are marketed. I mean, they really started to be marketed more towards youth culture, but also merchandising, which I don't know how he knew, because George Lucas agreed to have a smaller fee as a director to get, like, 40% of the merchandise sales. Like, how, I don't know how he knew that that would be a thing. Also really interesting, which I didn't know, and I knew this because someone who was of age at the time told me this, is that the Star Wars toys, and I looked it up, it is correct, was the first time that they were like the miniature kind like we know. They were like dolls. Action figures were like dolls. And I've seen old G.I. Joes, and I was like, why do they look like dolls? Yeah, because the old G.I. Joes were that way. Yeah, and so this was this was the first time they decided to actually like make them sort of pocket size, and then it changed the entire, you know, action figure industry. 
Yeah. Um, I did not know that. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I forget who it was, but it was someone who's like in his like mid to late forties was like telling me this, and I was like, wow, I had no idea. Um, and then on that, we're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, we're going to talk about some of the bad stuff that happened and the importance of Marsha Lucas. And who shot first? Okay, so I just wanted to quickly talk about Marsha Lu- Lucas, since we are women. And she's sort of... <laughs> Well, she's sort of cut out of the narrative, you know, and I found this out, like, this year. Oh, no, you said narrative, and I know it connects to something we're talking about later, but I instantly was like, I put myself back in the narrative. Which I listened to on the way there. (laughs) That's a a Hamilton Hamilton. reference, anyone who doesn't know. But anyway, Marsha uh, Lucas uh, was George Lucas's uh, first wife. She edited all of the Star Wars movies. Um, They got divorced after Jedi came out, and... um, what sort of has come out sort of recently, based on some books and obviously, you know, Sports Awakens and more interest on it, um, is that she really was what people refer to as sort of the heart of Star Wars. Um, she also was uh, his, you know, harshest critic and, you know, gave him a lot of feedback that was very honest, and he was able to take that feedback from her. And Mark Hamill even said that she really was the warmth in the heart of those films, and there's a huge difference in their films or his films, I should say, after he was married to her. So I just think it's really interesting. It was her idea to kill Obi-Wan Kenobi. Um, he really wanted to cut out the little cute little kiss that they had when uh, Luke and Leia swing across sort of the canyon to get to the other side of the Death Star. Um, and she completely re-edited the trench warfare scene uh, so that it had a lot of... Um, well, I mean, just watching it. Like, as a kid, I was bored by that scene. I am sorry. I just... I watched Star Wars, I guess, for different reasons. But watching it now as an adult, it was so exciting. I was like, I can't believe it. But she felt that if the audience didn't cheer when Han Solo came in at the last second to save them, or save Luke, and her help Luke, that there really was no point of it. So I just kind of wanted to give her a little sort of notice. But now we should talk about Harrison's uh, performance in the movie. As Han Solo? Yes, which is really a big breakout part. Uh, It's his first real lead. Yeah, which... Where he actually has an arc as a character. Yeah, that ends in The Force Awakens. Um, well, <laughs> we won't talk about that yet. <laughs> um, what I, I think is really interesting, since we are watching it all in order, is that... And I said this last time, that in American Graffiti, I felt like, oh, that's a movie star. Like, I saw this sort of charm, and I saw this really big difference from what he had done in the past but like it was like everything that he had sort of had inside of him and worked on came together with this part like it was ridiculously perfect for him yeah i i love han i sorry i was writing because i realized one of your trivias is wrong i just i just yeah it says i have a bad feeling about this and said how many times it was said in every movie and they left one of han's out oh they did because when han is hanging in return of the jedi and the Ewoks are trying to burn them. Oh, he says it he then. He says, I have a bad feeling about this. Because my brother and I had a fight about it. Because he didn't believe that Han... He said, oh, I knew Han Solo was going to die the minute he said, I have a bad feeling about this. Because that was the first time Han Solo ever said, I have a bad feeling about this. I said, that's not right. And he's like, yes, it is. And then my brother and I, like, I was like, no, you're wrong. Han Solo says it in four. And I'm pretty sure he says it in six. And he goes, no, I was right. Why would anyone fight with you about that? Because he's my brother. Okay. But, um, because he says it in, when they're in the trash compactor. Yes. And then he says it when he's hanging off the stick, when the Ewoks are trying to burn. And he says it in Empire. Right? Did he say it? No, he doesn't say it in Empire. Oh, no, Leia does. Leia says Leia it in Empire. Leia says it in Empire. Because it's when they're in the, the mouth of the thing, and she's like, yeah. I have a bad feeling about this. And it's like, Wah! This doesn't feel like ground. Well, and it's we're skipping not. ahead. <laughs> yeah, guys. On Empire. Let's just talk about Empire. No, but yeah, his Empire's performance in this favorite. was like... It, after everything we've seen, Han is like completely different. And you hear a lot of things like on set of like him improving lines and feeling, feeling very comfortable, like kid don't get cocky is an improv. Pretty much the whole scene when he's talking to um, the guy at the other end of the sort of comm link when Luke is going after Leia... Is completely improv. Yeah, where he's just like, yeah, I'm fine. How are you? Yeah, which he did on purpose. Apparently, he wanted it to be so spontaneous that he didn't memorize it. So he, and that's the first take. Oh, Harrison. 
But there are also lines that they talk, that everyone talked about and Harrison talks about that he, they couldn't even get out and he would get really frustrated because he considers himself a four-take kind of a guy. You can say this. You can write this shit, but you can't say it. That's what he said to yeah. dear old George. Because George Lucas doesn't know how to write dialogue for the life of him. I'm going to plead the fifth on that. He doesn't. He doesn't. You can't plead the fifth. No. He can't we'll write ta- dialogue. We'll talk a lot about that when we get to Empire because it's such a huge difference. Because he doesn't write it. <laughs> nope, he didn't. And that's why the dialogue is real good. But apparently they did improv a lot on that set. Oh, um, sorry, I just read this, and I really like this story okay. about Debbie Reynolds. I love that story. Let's tell a Carrie Fisher story. Yay, Carrie! Um, Carrie so Fisher Debbie story? Reynolds um, called, like, she threw a fit because they didn't have a lot of the money, like, to fly the cast out first class stuff, so they That's flew really the coach budget. to England, and Debbie Reynolds called and, like, flipped out on George Lucas, saying that her daughter... Wasn't flying coach, blah, 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 blah. And so then Carrie Fisher said, Mother, I want to fly coach. Will you fuck off? And that's one of my favorite Carrie Fisher stories because I just love the fact I that she told her mother story. to fuck off. Because, yeah. oh, uh, Carrie. So the movie became, like, one of, at the time, the biggest box office hits of ever. ever. It still is. Not this one, but like a Star Wars movie. Well, Titanic. No, Titanic beat it. No, I'm saying, but Star a Star Wars movie. Oh, I see. That's because they count the re-release. Yeah. They no, count. I'm saying the Force Awakens is now the biggest box oh, the Force movie Awakens. of all time. No, no, it's not actually. It is Avatar. No, it beat Avatar. I thought it didn't beat it Avatar. Beat a- it beat. Everything. Are we talking worldwide? Or are we talking nationwide? Everything. It beat oh, Avatar. Oh, thank God. Oh, it we beat were I was every, really. Re- it beat every record that has ever stayed. You know, stood because it's still in theaters and it's being released on right. DVD. See, I was kind of, I was really keeping track of it until it went to China, and then I just got distracted it by beat my Av- life. It beat everything. It beat Avatar. It beat. All I'm of it. so excited. I was really rooting for it to beat Avatar. It did because I don't really like Avatar. I like Avatar. I just whoa, like Star Wars better. Obviously, <laughs> but yeah, it beat everything. Yeah, so, uh, and George Lucas was, didn't even really believe it. They kept calling him and saying their lines around the block and people are going crazy. And it was true and it's still that way. Well, a lot of really bad things happened on set. Should I talk about yeah, really talk about quickly? The bad things. Okay, so, because I can understand why they thought maybe it was doomed. So, George Lucas collapsed from exhaustion and hypertension. Uh, Peter Mayhew had heat exhaustion and dehydration. This one I think people know. Mark Hamill blew a blood vessel under water during the garbage scene <laughs> and so they had to shoot him like from the side because he had like big burst be- vessel on the side uh, the makeup artist was hospitalized so the cantina characters were not really ready according to Lucas uh, and then right before the ending I believe Mark Hamill was in a horrible car accident which I had heard about like every time I mention Mark Hamill to my mother she's like oh he was so different after the car accident like, I think she had a crush on him, maybe, because she always says that, oh, he just, he was never the same after the car accident. Um, but I didn't know how bad it was. Like, I knew he had plastic surgery, but he lost most of his nose and his cheek. Um, and so they had to do some st- stuff from behind or have, like, a double for some stuff. Carrie Fisher hated taping down her breasts because she wasn't wearing a bra. Because no, because bras don't exist in space. Underwear and no underwear in space. Uh, Alec Guinness was upset his role was reduced, and the R2-D2 remote had a lot of sort of glitches. Oh, that's my favorite blooper in the prequels. In the prequels? Well, R2-D2 is just rolling, and he just keeps oh, rolling yeah. down a hill, and they all just turn and watch R2-D2 roll down a hill. I remember that. It's pretty so great. should we do some uh, cleanup business from last week? Sure. So we talked about Hamilton last week and how it's our favorite um, musical and uh, how uh, Harrison went to see it. And we actually found out what he thought about it. Yeah, because he did a Tumblr Q&A. I asked multiple questions. And so did I, and... as myself and as the podcast. And we got no questions in. Some girl got two. I was pissed. Yeah, I, I kind of wonder if like they were just flipping the questions on the screen and he decided if he wanted to answer them or not. I know, I think someone chose them. Then why would you pick someone with the same, oh, whatever. Anyway, he said that it was unbelievable, complex, exciting, talented, and provocative. Just a mind-blowing experience. I really enjoyed meeting some of the people involved with it afterwards. We would agree with you. I love it, Harrison. Uh, oh so my God, I just realized I'm a degree. I'm 
two degrees away now. From Harrison Ford? Uh-huh. How? Um, I sat in a theater with Benjamin Walker, whose ex-mother-in-law was Meryl Streep, who's outside Harrison Ford, two degrees away. Wow, that's, it's really pushing it there. <laughs> it worked! Okay, whatever works for you. Um, so we know we, we have a lot of news and stuff, like the Tumblr, like Indiana Jones 5. Yes. Uh, we have a lot of news on Tumblr, but what we really want to talk about is a contest. Yes, we're, we're going to have an awesome contest. you want to tell them about the contest? Sure. Um, so the concert is, um, we you have to listen to the podcast, and we'll post a trivia question after each episode in the month of April. So two questions um, with the hashtag full forward contact. Contest, and um, you just have to listen if you've subscribed on iTunes and you answer the question. But you have to—it's a social media follow, so you have yes. to be following us on at least Tumblr, Tumblr, or Twitter. Both will get you another extra entry. So everything that you're following um, and subscribing to will get you a entry, as well as emailing the answer to us. But you have to be following us on one of our at least one to be able to enter that many times. Yes, and um, so what you'll you'll win. A cool prize. Oh my god, the prize is so awesome. Um, do you want to explain the, the prize? Sure. So um, the prize is a vintage rare glossy picture of Harrison Ford on the set of Star Wars A New Hope in the Millennium Falcon. I rarely see this picture, and it looks to me like it is a picture that was eventually used and printed in lobby cards. Uh, and it's from 1977. I don't know if the, literally the picture is from 77, but it looks very old. I got off eBay. Rachel wants it. I do want it. But, uh, but we will let you we will guys post have all, it. Yeah, we will post all the rules. So you could literally, like, enter, like, ten times, really. You can enter a lot, and you can win it. But you yeah. have to subscribe and listen, answer trivia. Exactly. And then once you do that, we'll give you... We'll give it. you stuff, yes. And we will un- we'll announce the winner. So we have... This is... you got to listen to this episode, which is dropping April 7th. And then our next episode, which is the movie Heroes, which is April 22nd, and we'll announce the w- winner on our May 5th episode for Force 10 to Navarone. Um, I was laughing because Marika just did, um, what is this? Um, has oh. degrees of separation from Harrison Ford because she has an no. IMDb. No. Lauren does, yeah. Oh, me? Oh. Yeah. And it's Lauren Milberg was in 10,000 Saints. Yes. Um, with Haley Steinfeld. Yes, I was. Haley Steinfeld was in Ender's Game. Oh, my God! Harrison Ford. I, I didn't know that you worked with Haley Steinfeld, because I could have yes. told you that if I knew you worked with Haley Steinfeld. Yeah, she's lovely. I want to type myself in, so I'm, I'm three? on IMDb. So, so I'm three? No, you're, you're two. I'm two. You're two. You're two. You have three? I'm Marika, has, Marika, who's never seen Harrison Ford movie in her damn life. So we beat has three. What all of us have beat you. Rachel has a Harrison. Rachel the third. Are you has, on IMDb? Yes. Do you, do you mean Rachel Leach the third? No. Yeah, that's what I want. Has a Harrison Ford one number of infinity. What does that mean? What? Help me. How do I do this? I mean, yeah, I, I s- don't know if IMDb knows that I saw Benjamin Walker last <laughs> no, night. No, I don't think it does that. <laughs> I'm linked through Benjamin Walker. I don't. The only acting thing that I can think of was working with Nick Kroll and John Mulaney during all those that's what I use. Hey! Uh, It works. Oh, in that instance, then, I know, like, everybody because of UCB, so I'm sure I'm fine. Like, I've met him somehow through people. No, this is working. I forgot she was in Ender's Game. Okay. Yeah, she's in Ender's Game. Yeah. Because eventually we'll be watching that. And my scene is actually with her. Like, she's in the movie. Like, Are you Biffles with Haley Steinfeld? No. <laughs> we had a lovely time in, in the in the break room talking. Or like, Did she sing, You're such a... Da, na, 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 no. No, I just talked to her and her we mother. We get derailed by finding out how many separations we are from Harrison Ford. But, so, just to kind of, like, wrap it up. I know it's hard to talk about just one Star Wars, so like Return of the Jedi is gonna be like I know the really big so one because we want to talk about. I promise not to bring. I'm gonna bring no not research. Not 15 pages. And you of know what? The, do you know what the crazy part is? I was like, oh great, we're doing Star Wars. I don't have to do any research. It's gonna be awesome. We're just gonna talk about the movie. And then I fell down a rabbit hole. Well, because it's so hard to just talk about the first Star Wars, like, and not talk about Empire and Return yeah. of the Jedi. So that's why it's like it. 
feels like I'm like, oh, I feel like there's so much I haven't said, but it, I, oh, I've said everything I want to say. We, it's, I we have to talk mind. about really quickly who shot first because we talked about it. And we have to. I don't attack. care. I kind of don't care either, but I get what people are saying is that he becomes a more dangerous character. But you're right; it doesn't really matter. But I I mean, I'm all about the dangerous boys, but I don't. I think people feel that it took the danger out of him. And and what's weird though is that George Lucas says that was always the always the intention, and then he said, "Well, we had to change it because Han Solo was going to marry the princess, so he couldn't be that way." So I kind of don't like the fact that he won't commit and just say what he did. Peter Mayhew, like, posted pictures from the script, and he did shoot first. But honestly, it it doesn't really matter. Whatever you want it to be is what I happened. don't care. He shot him. Greedo's dead. It looks also really fake in that scene. Greedo looked like a man in a mask, so well, I don't yeah. understand. But it also looked weird because they were so close. Why would he shoot the wall? God, God, I don't know. I don't care. I don't like any it. of the additions that they added. No, they put up... But they put weird animals walking across the field, and you're like, why did you need to add that? The Java scene is oh. the exact same scene with Greedo. It's superfluous. Why do we need it? We don't. We don't the need the same information scene. gets given, and then you lose the urgency when they're like, we got to get on the ship because you're like, oh, he just shot a guy. Like they got to get on the ship, as opposed to this weird scene in the middle, like the momentum is gone. But it's, mostly, it's the exact same it's scene, done. and but, we're gone too. What? We're done. I'm saying I was. Oh, we're done, and we're done. Um, So, yeah, follow us on our social media accounts. Um, Mine is Lauren Milberger on Twitter, L-A-U-R-E-N-M-I-L-B-E-R-G-E-R. We, The Fordcast, are The Fordcast PC on Twitter and The Fordcast Podcast on Tumblr. Um, I am Rachel Leishman on Twitter. It's R-I-C-H-E-L-L-E-I-S-H-M-A-N. I'm Rach Solo on Tumblr. And my Instagram is my name, but just with a hyph- uh, underscore between Rachel and Leishman. You're such a rebel. What a rebel. Rebel, rebel. Rebel, rebel. Um, and that's it for this episode of the Fordcast. Bye.